the condition a vector has to satisfy during its parallel transport is given by this equation that the covariant derivative of that vector has to be zero. That can be stated in two ways. One as a covariant derivative taken with respect to the proper time as is shown in this equation or in terms of the usual covariant derivative that we have already seen. That is the derivative taken with respect to the respective coordinate x mu. Having seen the condition for parallel transport, now let us look at the following. Let us see if this process of parallel transport of a vector from one point P1 to another point P2 depends on the curve, the path that I have chosen to transport. For instance, if I am transporting the vector parallel to itself from point P1 to point P2 along this curve, will I get a vector at P2 which is the same as the one that I will get if I do the parallel transport along any other curve, let us say this one. In order to answer this, let us first consider the parallel transport of a vector in a space which is completely flat. Like for instance, the surface of this board. In fact, we can consider it here itself. These are two curves which are drawn on the surface of this board, which is a flat two-dimensional surface. If I consider any vector on this board, let's say that one, and transport it parallel to itself, I end up with this vector. Now, if I do the parallel transport along a different curve, I could do that. Again, I end up with the same vector. So it looks like when you consider such a thing on the surface of a board, a two-dimensional flat space, there is no difference for the vector that you get at point P2 by parallel transporting a vector from point P1. They're all the same. They're the same for any curve that you choose on the surface of this board. Now let us do the same exercise on the surface of a sphere. So let me uh, demonstrate this by considering the surface of a sphere. This yellow patch, you can think of that as the equator of the sphere. This can be thought of as the equator. Well, this one, yeah. This is the equator of the sphere. Let us consider one point on the equator. I hope you can see it is this point, which is what I will choose as P1. Let me choose my second point, P2, as a point at the north pole of the sphere, somewhere here. Now let me consider some vector on the surface of the sphere. You should know that this vector that I'm considering is a vector which is completely lying on the surface of the sphere. In particular, I'll consider the vector that is tangential to the equator now, like this, the one that I have drawn here. So let us use this pen, the red color pen, to indicate that vector. Now let me tr transport this vector parallel to itself from point P1 to point P2 on the north pole. I'll do that by ensuring that at every point along this curve, the vector is as much parallel to the previous point. So I reach here. So this is the vector that I get by transporting a tangent vector to the equator 
parallel to itself to the north pole. Now let us do this exercise by considering another curve to the north pole, which I'll draw along the equator. I'll draw this curve until I reach a point which is on the other side of the sphere. And then, as you can see, I, I will take a longitudinal curve towards the north pole. This one. I hope you can see. The one we started here proceeded along the equator until I reach another longitude, which is almost on the other side, opposite side of the sphere, and then proceeded upwards to the peak. If I do this, you can see what happens. So parallel transporting this vector along the equator, remember this vector was tangent to the equator. So I could do that. I reach here. Then again, I'm transporting it parallel to itself along the longitude. And I reach the point P2. Now you see, the two vectors that I get are not aligning with each other. They're not parallel to each other. They are different vectors. So it's clear that this process of parallel transport depends on the curve, the path along which you choose to do the process. Not only that they, have, they depend on the path chosen, we can see that by comparing the results of this experiment, down on the surface of the board and down on the surface of the sphere, we can see that it is for the sphere which, whose surface is a curved space that the vector at point P2 is different from the vector that you get while, by doing a parallel transport along the longitude. For a flat space, they are the same. So it is clear from this demonstration that the difference in vector that you get by going to point P2 by doing a parallel transport is actually capturing the curvature of the space in which we have considered both these curves. OK. Now using this, we will now devise a method to calculate the curvature of the space. Let us consider the point P1, a point P1 in some arbitrary space, which, is, which has some curvature due to the presence of the gravitational field. And consider a parallel transport of a vector with components V alpha to a point P2. We will do this parallel transport along two different points along two different curves. One is a curve that passes through a point A. The point A is chosen such that I can go from point P1 to point A by varying only one of the coordinates that I have. I have four coordinates, remember, in my space time. I can go from point P1 to point A by varying only one of the four coordinates. Let's choose that coordinate to be x1. The remaining coordinates, x0, x2, x3, all stay constant while going from point P1 to point A. Then the point A is also so chosen that I could go from point A to point P2 by varying only one other coordinate, which is the coordinate x2. While going from A to P2, every other coordinate except x2 remains constant. That's one curve. The other curve that we choose is the one that passes through point B. And the point B is so chosen that I can go from point P1 to point B only by varying coordinate x2. And Point B is also so chosen that I can go from point B to point P2, again, by varying only one coordinate, and that is coordinate x1. So if we now transport V alpha parallel to itself from point P1 to point B to point P2, I will get a vector. I will compare the result 
with the parallel transport of the same vector from point P1 through point A to point P. Let us start with start from the point P1. Let x1 0 and x2 0 be the coordinates of the point P1. The value of vector components V alpha at point P1 will be x1 0 and x2 0 will be its value at the, those coordinates. We are not specifying the remaining set of coordinates because they remain the same in all of, along all these curves. Let point, let point A be, have coordinates. Remember, when I go from point P1 to point A, the coordinate that changes is x1 alone. So, let's choose the coordinate of the point A to be one which is different from the point P1 only in their x1 coordinate and let's choose that coordinate to be x1 plus x1 0 plus delta x1 x2 x2 0 x2 0. Similarly let me choose point B which I get from point P1 by varying only coordinate x2 to have coordinates x1 0 comma x2 0 plus delta x2. Naturally point P2 should have coordinates x1 0 plus delta x1 comma x2 0 plus delta x2. Let us now find out the value of vector v alpha at point A. That can be expressed directly as v alpha at x1 0 plus delta x1 comma x2. Now if we consider the situation where the difference in coordinate delta x1 between point p1 and a is an infinitesimally small amount then I can write the value of v alpha at point a as a Taylor series expansion around point p1 with only the term involving first power of delta x1 in that Taylor series explicitly it will look it will take the form v alpha x1 0 x2 0 plus the next term involves derivative of v alpha and that will be proportional to the difference delta x1 but that derivative now has to be taken by keeping the remaining coordinates constant hence it has to be a partial derivative del v alpha by del x1 at x1 0 at the point uh, with coordinate x1 0 times the difference in coordinates delta x1. This is the form of the Taylor series. When delta x1 as well as delta x2 are such that their squares can be taken to be 0. They are infinitesimally small. Now let us look at this term, the second term in the Taylor series expansion. 
In the second term, we see that there's a derivative of V alpha with respect to coordinate x1 evaluated at point x10. But remember, we are doing a parallel transport. And while doing parallel transport, we know that at every point, this condition must be satisfied by the vector. In particular, if I consider nu equal to 1, then I know that it must be equal to minus of gamma alpha 1 beta v beta. So, I could use this form for the value of the derivative at point x10 and write v alpha x10 plus delta x1 comma x2 as v alpha x10 x20 minus gamma alpha 1 beta times v beta all evaluated at point with coordinate x10, x20, which is the point P by the way. So let me write it inside a bracket times delta x1. So, so that is the form of the vector at point A. Now we find the form of the vector P2 also in terms of the vector at A, which in turn has been written in terms of the vector at point P1. Okay, so the vector at point P2, let me write it in short by writing it as P2 alone without explicitly showing the coordinate, which are obvious from this figure. The vector at point P2 can also be written as v alpha at a, which is what we have found earlier in the previous step, plus a partial derivative of v alpha taken with respect to coordinate x2, because that's the only coordinate that changes when you go from a to p2, evaluated at point a, at point a, times the amount of displacement in coordinate x2, delta x2. Again, since we are doing a parallel transport, I could find this derivative also in a similar form. And I could write V alpha P2 completely in terms of the vector at A, in the form v alpha at a minus gamma alpha 2 beta v beta at a times delta x. Next, what we do is to write v alpha a that we have in this expression for v alpha p2 in terms of what we have found for v alpha in terms of v alpha at p1. So in the earlier equation, remember this is the, this, this point with coordinates x1, 0 plus delta x1 and x2 indicates the point A. So this expression gives us V alpha at A in terms of V alpha at P1. Let us substitute that equation into the expression for V alpha P2. Then we get
that is the first term alone. Then substituting it into the second term, we get V alpha 2 beta times the second term the second factor will have the form V beta at V1. Remember, this is V1 gamma alpha 2 beta at A at A times V beta at P1 minus gamma alpha 1 beta v beta all at p1 times delta x1 the whole into delta x2. There's a mistake in the indices used here. I should be using beta as the free index for the expression inside the brackets and hence use some other index here for the summed over index. Now we are one step away from obtaining V alpha at P2 completely in terms of quantities evaluated at P1 and that is we must write the connection term gamma alpha 2 beta which is given at A in this expression also in terms of the same quantity or, and possibly its derivatives evaluated at point P1. And that can again be done by using a Taylor series. as gamma alpha 2 beta at P1 plus the partial derivative of gamma alpha 2 beta taken with respect to the coordinate x1 which is the only coordinate that is different between A and P1 evaluated at P1 times delta x. Now we can substitute this expression for gamma at A and finally obtain V alpha at P2 as V alpha P1 minus gamma alpha 1 beta into V beta all evaluated at P1 multiplied by delta X1 minus gamma in place of gamma at A we must substitute this where we get the first term by simply multiplying by replacing this with gamma evaluated P1 giving us gamma alpha 2 beta at P1 times V beta at P1 multiplied by delta X2 plus gamma alpha 2 beta at P1 into gamma beta 1 kappa V kappa all at P1 multiplied by delta X1 into delta X2 
there's one more term remaining, which is coming arising out of the second factor, second term in the Taylor series expansion of gamma at A. If you observe the second term, it already carries a factor of delta x1. So when you substitute that in place of gamma, you observe that when you multiply that factor with the second term in this expression, which already has a factor of delta x1, you get delta x1 square, which we should ignore as per, our, as per the approximation that we have chosen. So the only term that this will contribute to is the factor that we get by multiplying this to that, which gives us minus derivative of gamma alpha 2 beta by del x1 evaluated at p1 times v beta evaluated at p1, the whole multiplied by delta x1 delta x2. So all of this evaluated. So now we have obtained v alpha at p2 completely in terms of various factors whose values are evaluated at the point p1. This is the expression of the vector that we obtained at p2 through parallel transport along the curve that passes through A. Now we must obtain the same ob object V alpha at P2 but by considering the parallel transport of a vector through a different curve which now we choose as the one that passes through B. So let's indicate this with a subscript that V alpha P2 in this expression has been obtained by transporting through the point A while this let us indicate using the subscript B to indicate that it is obtained by transporting through a curve that passes through B. Now it is not difficult to deduce what V alpha P2 from this expression is going to be. To obtain this expression, what we could do is to replace x1 seen in this expression with x2 and vice versa. If we do that, we get V alpha at P1 minus gamma alpha once must be replaced with 2. 2 beta v beta at p1 into delta x2 minus gamma alpha 2s must be replaced with 1 v beta all evaluated at p1 delta x1 plus gamma alpha 1 beta gamma beta 2 kappa v kappa multiplied by delta x1 delta x2 minus gamma alpha 1 beta by x2 v beta at p1 multiplied by delta x1 delta x2. Now what we wanted to look at was the difference of these two vectors because that's what is expected to give us the information about the curvature of the space in which we have done this parallel transport. Practically it is giving us the curvature of that surface which 
is bound by this particular curve p1 a p2 b p p1 so there's a surface a closed surface or if you wish there's a surface which is bound by the curve closed curve p1 a p2 b p1 it is the curvature of that surface that the difference of vector v alpha at v alpha a and v alpha b must encode let us see what that difference is if we take the difference difference between these two we get some delta v let me indicate it as v alpha a p2 minus v alpha b p2 we get observe that several terms in both these expressions are going to cancel when we take the difference for example these two terms will cancel each other while this one will get cancelled with this and this will get cancelled with that all we are now left with are the terms those terms which we could easily observe are have those terms that have coefficients that are coefficients of delta x1 delta x2 so picking up only the non zero terms we get del 2 of gamma alpha to 1 beta where i have indicated the partial derivative with respect to x2 as a subscript 2 for the partial derivative symbol minus a similar term arising from the top which has minus of del 1 gamma alpha 2 beta then comes the term gamma alpha 2 beta gamma alpha 2 beta gamma beta 1 kappa into v kappa minus gamma alpha 1 beta gamma beta 2 kappa v kappa all of which is multiplied by the factors delta x1 delta x2 there's a factor of i'm sorry there's a factor of v beta which is present here as well this factor v beta into delta x1 delta x2 is also present in the first term Now it's easy by replacing the dummy indices with the same as what we have used in the second term, namely kappa, to write the expression which gives us a quantity that measures curvature of the space time as
टेल टू गामा अल्फा वन कापा माइनस डेल वन गामा अल्फा टू कापा प्लस गामा अल्फा टू बेटा जो गामा बेटा वन कापा माइनस गामा अल्फा वन बेटा जो गामा बेटा टू कापा the difference in vector is expected to be proportional to the value of the vector at t1 that's natural and it is also expected to be expected to depend on the area of the surface that is enclosed by this closed curve in addition to which comes the factor which measures the curvature and that's why we identify this factor as the curvature now we could denote this quantity using a short notation and we can fix what that quantity should be by observing the free indices of what is on the right hand side observe that on the right hand side alpha kappa 1 and 2 are the free indices so let me call it r, r alpha kappa 1 now this quantity i have obtained by considering one particular surface and closed by a curve along which only the coordinates x1 and x2 change suppose i had considered a surface enclosed by a curve along which x mu and x mu had varied then i would be getting the curvature of that surface out as r alpha kappa mu mu which will have the form del mu gamma alpha mu kappa minus del mu gamma alpha mu kappa plus gamma alpha mu beta to gamma beta mu kappa minus gamma alpha mu beta gamma beta mu kappa this quantity is measuring the curvature of the space time and it is usually termed a riemann tensor or times a riemann riemann christoffel curvature tensor now before we end this lecture we could observe couple of important properties of riemann christoffel curvature tensor which is simply often referred to as the riemann tensor it is that the, since the curvature of the space time is measured by this we could say that the space time would be flat if r alpha kappa mu nu is zero everywhere in that space next couple of important properties observe we can directly observe that this tensor is anti symmetric in the last two indices that is 
the pointer change the respective positions of mu and nu to get our alpha kappa nu mu that should be equal to minus of r alpha kappa nu now if we define the quantity now observe that the riemann christoffel curvature tensor is has one contravariant index while it has three covariant indices if suppose we define a quantity that has all covariant indices let me term it r alpha kappa mu nu by multiplying this with the metric tensor g alpha beta we could find a few more symmetric properties for this tensor that we obtain as a completely covariant object that is the following you could easily observe that if suppose we exchange the pairs alpha kappa and mu nu as a block together so i consider alpha kappa as a block and mu nu together as a block if i interchange the positions of this block the tensor remains the same that is i get r mu nu alpha kappa to be the same as r alpha kappa mu nu so these are the important properties of riemann curvature tensor and in the very next class onwards we will learn quite a few important properties of the riemann christoffel tensor and understand more about its physical significance